All right. Well, thank you so much for being here this morning. Amen. I'm so glad that uh, Brother Al and Sister Linda are back. I'm so grateful that Sister Diane's here with us this morning. Amen. I sure do love Sister Diane. I love her energy. And I need some extra energy this morning. <laughs> I tell you, that extra hour of sleep is, is, uh, is crucial. The older we get, it seems like. But, uh, I think it's just because my children don't like to sleep at night. That's all. They, they keep us up and, and uh, we wake up tired. And then when we wake them up early, they're all cranky. They don't want to wake up. Does anybody need an outline this morning? All right, Sister Diane. Brother Dan, you mind? Thank you so much. Appreciate Brother Dan. Um, so if you weren't here last week, what we did is we, uh, we need one over here too for Sister Lupita, please. So this is uh, the second part of week three's uh, series on respond to God's grace, respond to God's grace. Last week, we uh, covered, oh boy, I knew I was going to do that. Lord, forgive me. Okay, thank you. Um, I was a bad start to Sunday school. Um, so last week, what we did is we covered two parts. Um, Number one, God sent the storm. You say, God sent the storm where? He sent the storm in Jonah's life as a result of his disobedience. Y'all remember how uh, the Lord Jesus or the Lord told Jonah to go to Nineveh, to preach unto the Ninevites, to repent. But he didn't. What he did is he went completely opposite to Tarshish because he didn't like the people of Nineveh. And uh, God sent the storm. He sent the storm because of his great love. He also sent the storm with his grace. He was very kind and gentle and patient with Jonah. Thank you again, babe. Sorry about that. Uh, number two, God heard Jonah's prayer. Remember how Jonah said, in the belly of the whale, or, or basically what he said is, in hell, had he cried out unto the Lord, and the Lord heard his prayer. You know what that tells you is, is that God will never forsake us. Amen. No matter what. Listen, even, even though we mess up and even though we sin, if we humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, what does he say? Second Chronicles 7, 14. He says, and I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. Amen. God is willing to forgive. In fact, doesn't the Bible say in Isaiah chapter 1, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Amen. God wants to reason with us. God wants us to pray to him. And, and Jonah, when he got broken in the midst of that storm, in the midst of the belly of the whale there, what he did is he prayed unto God. And that's a wonderful thing for us to do is for us, A, to acknowledge our sin. Jonah acknowledged his sin. And B, he prayed. He prayed. And the Bible says that God heard his prayer. God heard Jonah's prayer. And then... Uh, God definitely brings us to prayer. God brought Jonah to prayer in the midst of that storm. And then God listens to prayer. And this week, what we're going to do is we're going to cover the second part here in this week's study on responding to God's grace. Now, now Brother Dan uh, spoke on listening to the Lord's voice. And that was entitled, uh, Listening for God's Voice. And he spoke on Elijah. How Elijah there, um, Jezebel had threatened Elijah, and uh, Elijah had basically gone, and, and under a juniper tree there, he just basically wanted to die. But then God uh, sent him to a mountain place, and, and as he ran away, uh, God brought a storm there, and an earthquake, and a fire, and, and the Bible says that God wasn't in the fire, and God wasn't in that uh, storm, but God was in that still, small voice speaking to him. And as a result of God speaking in that still, small voice, it kept, it kept Elijah moving forward. It kept Elijah from turning away and from actually wanting to commit suicide and wanting to end his life to all of a sudden wanting to serve God again and give him that fire. God always speaks to us. But when God speaks to us, we need to respond to his grace. Amen. So this week, we're going to go ahead and cover... Uh, the second part there, number three, uh, God gave Jonah a second chance. God gave Jonah a second chance. Let me ask you this question. 
How many chances has God given you? I can't count them. I'll be honest with you. Come on. Let me hear it. Amen. Amen. Come on. Isn't that the truth, though? Listen, I, I'm the first one to admit and to tell you, God has given me chance after chance after chance after chance. And I, and I feel like I'm like Israel, stiff-necked and rebellious and hard-hearted. And, and God still has patience. Yes. And God still has grace. And God still has mercy. And, and, and God is still kindly, gently leading softly in that still small voice. And, and when I mess up, prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love, right? As that, as that hymn talks about, God gently, as a shepherd, leads his sheep to, to, to the green pastures, to the straight in their way. Thank God for giving us chance after chance after chance. Amen. Amen. Now imagine, imagine if we were the Lord. Boy, we'd be striking some people down. I tell you, you're going to hell and you're, you're judgment for you. You're, you're going to prison for about 300 years. And right or wrong, I, I think most of the Democrats will probably be in prison if I was, if I was God. But, uh, oh, yeah, definitely. Amen to that. <laughs> but, uh, but honestly, on a serious note, thank God for God's second chance. God had given Jonah a second chance, right? You know, you remember that when Jonah was on that ship and he was headed to Tarshish, and, and it, it's so funny, you know, the Lord has a sense of humor, the Holy Spirit pinned down that Jonah was in that boat fast asleep. You know, how, how, can, you, how can you sleep knowing that you're running from God? I don't know about you, but I, I won't be able to sleep at night. Just knowing that, that clearly God Almighty spoke to me and I said, no, Lord. No, I'm going this way. I know I'm supposed to go this way, but no, Lord. I don't know how I'll be able to sleep. My conscience will be, would just be beating me up for that. But Jonah falls fast asleep. Why? Because, because of his great hatred towards the people of Nineveh. Yeah. He was prejudiced, right? Yes. And listen, listen, that was his sin. But uh, we're, we're very easy to point the finger at Jonah and say, oh, he was prejudiced. But what about our sin? What's, what's your sin? What's the sin that easily makes you go back and, and turn your back on God? Whatever it is, the Lord knows it. Amen? Not to drink. Okay. Not to drink. It, it, it's so easy to just get convinced. That's why I have to let those girls, I, I don't want... To be around them. Amen. You know what that's called? Sanctification. I, I got um, all these people that I know. I just got into, God removed me. Amen. It Praise was God hard, for that. Hard. Because they called me and said, oh, so and so's having a birthday, let's go. Or, you know, I'm going to church. Amen. Yeah. And they think that's weird. I'm weird now. Yeah, and the Bible says uh, they think it's strange, right? They think it. You, they think you're weird. They think it's strange. Hey, how come you're not? Yes, ma'am. My kid said at first I misunderstood him. Got kind of angry. My thought was angry, but they said I'm crazy for the Lord, and I was like, what? Oh, thank you. I don't think I don't think uh, we can do too much for the Lord, considering what He did for us, right? But thank God here that God gave Jonah a second chance. Uh, let me read this to you. A good result of God's chastisement is that it can bring us to a more urgent obedience. To a more urgent obedience. You know, sometimes God has to shake the ground from underneath us to cause us to be able to awake and say, okay, I need to change my perspective. I'm focused on the wrong things. I'm focused on the temporal. I'm focused on the things of the world. When in, in fact, what I need to do is I need to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and put him and give him the preeminence in my heart and in my mind and in my life. God does it because of his great love towards us. He'll bring the storm. He'll, 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 he'll bring certain things in our life 
to be able to try to change our perspective and then give us a second chance and then tell us, okay, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to continue to go down that path and, and keep eating with the swine like the prodigal? Remember how the prodigal told his dad, give me, give me my inheritance, basically smacking his dad in the face and saying, I, I basically wish you were dead so you can give me my inheritance now so I can go out and just blow it on, you know, prostitutes and drugs and drinking and whatever else, things of the world. And the Bible says everything ran out. And then all those people that were around him, that prodigal, all those quote unquote friends that were partying with him and living it up, all of a sudden when he didn't have anything, they weren't there anymore. They wouldn't even give him a piece of bread. You say, how do you know that? Because he was eating with the swine. They said, we want nothing to do with you. You got no more money? We want nothing to do with you. Right? Yeah, that's the truth. But, but, but when things hit the fan, who's always going to be there for you? Number one, God. And number two, your family. To a certain point, you can even push your family away if you keep messing up and keep messing up and keep messing up, right? But God will always be there. And thank God that that prodigal, like Jonah, as, as that prodigal ate with the swine and he realized, what am I doing here? <laughs> what am I doing eating with these pigs? I can go back and I can be like one of my dad's hired servants. I, I, I'm not even worthy to be called his son. He was, that's humility. That's humility. And I love it because as that prodigal came and his dad saw him, remember back in those days, Jewish tradition was Jewish men do not run. The Bible says that his father ran to him. What is that a sign of? That's a sign of our Heavenly Father. He gives us a second chance. And if we'll just wake up and say, you know what, I should have obeyed the voice of God and I should have went to Nineveh. I should have obeyed the voice of God and I shouldn't have asked my dad for his inheritance before he passed away. That was very disrespectful. But the father's waiting. The father's waiting for us to come back. Again, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as crimson. Right? Isaiah 118. Yeah. The Bible says this, Jonah 3, chapter uh, 3, verses 1 through 4, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. You notice this, God didn't stop speaking to Jonah. God kept speaking, Jonah, Jonah. He was stubborn. He was stubborn, but hey, we, we all are. Yeah. Right? If we'll admit it, a lot of us are like Jonah. Yeah. You say, well, I'm not prejudiced, but you have your sin, whatever yeah. the sin is, Right? And the Lord spoke to him a second time, Arise, Jonah, and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. I already told you to go and to preach to it. You notice how the Lord calls it the great city. Why does he call it the great city? Because there was a lot of people there. Right? So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. This was a really big city full of people. And he cried. Jonah's crying now, preaching, blowing the trumpet. And said, yet 40 days, Nineveh, and thou shalt be overthrown. I can only imagine that. We talked last week about how when Jonah was in the belly of the whale there, my wife had mentioned the three different stomachs of the whale. I don't know if any of you have studied that out or not, but how Jonah was in that whale and the stomach acid of that whale had bleached Jonah's skin and, and the stench of, the, of the, the stomach there and that stomach acid and all the dead fish in there or whatever, you know, uh, the, the whales eat. The smell, right? The horrible smell. And uh, remember, he had been basically fasting inside of that whale. No food for three days and three nights. I don't think he was eating any dead whatever in the stomach, right? So imagine how he looked. And he comes into Nineveh. And as he's crying and, 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 and preaching out, Nineveh, in 40 days, God's going to overthrow this place unless you repent. They knew he was dead serious, right? And I can only imagine, you know, the Bible doesn't say this, but I can only imagine... 
He gave them his testimony. He probably told them, listen, I, I disobeyed God. I disobeyed God and when God spoke to me, I ran, I went the other way and as a result of that, this is what happened to me. This is the reason why I look like this. And in 40 days, if you don't get right and you don't listen to the Lord, the same thing's going to happen to you times 10. It's going to be worse for you. Yeah, worse. Can you imagine that? You think something like, you think Jonah told his testimony and, and, and the, our testimony is powerful. Amen. Isn't it? Isn't that, isn't that what Revelation talks about? Yes. How we defeat Satan yes. by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our yes. testimony, yes. right? Yes. So when we give our testimony to people, if I see a, 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 you know, a druggie or a gangster or someone, I can say, listen, I, I came from certain things like that. And I kind of relate to you and I kind of understand you. But when I started to read the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ changed my life. What am I doing? I'm sharing my testimony. Transform. Yes. Amen. You get to share with your ex-girlfriends, right? Oh, they don't talk to me no more. That's okay. Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise That's okay. Crazy for the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. But listen, when they stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, oh, what a day that will be. The Bible says books will be open. Another book is open, which is the book of life. And the dead in Christ are judged. Everyone's judged according to their works. Revelation chapter 20, right? Yes. And whosoever's name is not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You're going to be happy, very, very happy on that day. That's the end. That you, Every day I tell them to put me in the book of life. That you Every are. You're day. sealed. Your name's written in the book of life. And Amen. I said, Lord, don't forget me. Put me in the book of life. Amen. What a beautiful prayer. What a beautiful prayer. God gave Jonah a second chance. Jonah goes back there and he obeys the Lord. And, and uh, he goes to Nineveh and he preaches to Nineveh. And in Jonah chapter 3 verses 5 through 6. So the people of Nineveh believe God. <laughs> Praise God. This is one of the greatest revivals in history. And proclaimed a fast. And they, they put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh. And the king arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from off of him, and covered him with sackcloths, and he sat in ashes. What happened here? The people believed God, and they turned from their ways. And, and, and as a result of respecting and, and getting a hold of the Lord, what they did is they fasted, and they prayed. The Bible says that they put on sackcloth. You know what sackcloth is? It's a, it's a garment that the king took off his royal apparel, probably royal purple, right? Uh, uh, fine linen. He took that off and he put on this, this itchy type of a garment. Why? As a result of him getting a hold of the Lord and saying, God, we have sinned against you. God, forgive us of our sins. Lord, we're serious for you. We're, we're fasting. We're putting away food from us. Even though food is a necessity, we're putting it away so that, because we want to get a hold of you, Lord. We want to let you know that we're serious about you, Lord. And guess what happened? God didn't destroy Nineveh. Right? God didn't destroy Nineveh. You know, there's a... There's some others in Scripture that God had given a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth chance to as well. Who was that? Well, one of them was Peter. Oh, Do you remember Peter? Peter? Yes. Peter said, Lord, I'll die with you, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew 26, 34, Jesus said unto Peter, Verily I say unto thee, Peter, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Three times. Three times you're going to deny me, Peter. Three times. But uh, the people came there and they saw him and they said, I, we, we think that you, you were with Jesus, weren't you? I don't know the man. I don't know him. He started to swear and he started to curse. I know not the man. When things hit the fan and, and he saw those Roman soldiers and the Sanhedrin and those Pharisees come and take Jesus by force. Right? And, and, and he saw that this is real. This is really happening now. And he saw that Jesus isn't doing anything about it. Remember, before, Jesus had power. 
But Jesus had basically allowed himself to be able to go into their hands. He willingly gave himself. Mm -hmm. Peter was afraid. Peter denied Christ thrice. And that rooster started to crow. And the word of the Lord prevailed and came to pass. As it will and as it has and, and as it will. Because remember, the final thing that we're waiting for now is that he says, Behold, I come as a thief in the night. He's going to return. Yeah. We're waiting for his return. Yeah. Amen. How come he didn't put the date or anything? This is kind of strange. Well, if you put the date, then everyone's going to sit there and live it up. <laughs> do whatever they want. And then on January 23rd, 2027, when he comes, the day before, they're all going to repent. And they're all going to cry out to God. No, no. He wants you to be aware. He wants you to be vigilant. He wants you to be righteous and holy and, and living for Him. He wants your heart. He wants your heart, not knowing when the day or the hour is. Yeah, like the five virgins. Yes. The other five, like they, they were like they, they were like the one you said, like, oh, one day He's going to come. Or, but the other ones was ready. Like, yes, they had their oil. Any, anytime He's, he's going to come, we are ready for Him. Amen. Perfect illustration. That oil was a representation of the Holy Spirit, right? And when that bridegroom came, they were ready. They were prepared, right? Are you prepared for the Lord's coming? Yes. Isn't that a good question? But speaking about Jonah here, how God had given him a second chance. God has given us second and third and fourth and fifth chance, right? And God keeps giving chances. But listen, there comes a time to where... The grace runs out. You know, my, my father used to say, when you keep cutting at the skin, pretty soon you're going to get to the bone. Amen. You can't cut no more. Amen. Right? So God's grace keeps going and keeps going. And God will keep speaking. Please, please don't, don't keep at that sin. Please don't keep doing that. Please don't keep smoking that drug. Please don't keep going to these parties. Please don't keep drinking. Please don't keep doing these things. Don't keep committing adultery. Don't cheat on your wife, on your spouse. And we keep rejecting, rejecting, rejecting the Lord. Pretty soon, that long suffering and that patience comes to an end. And then we face Him. Or we can humble ourselves. Because speaking about Peter, remember, Peter denied Christ thrice, three times, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then if you look really quickly, I'm looking at your time, look at John, really quickly here, look at John, John chapter, <coughs> John chapter number 21. After these scenes, Jesus, uh, look at John 21. Bible says this in John 21 verse 2 there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel and of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee the two other of disciples Simon Peter saith unto all the disciples remember how he was a leader he says I go fishing what's he doing going back to the world remember Jesus had told them remember Jesus called them out from that life he says follow me for I'll make you fishers of men come out from the world Right? Yeah. Remember, he's a commercial fisherman. This is all he knew. This was this is how he made money, made gain. This is how he made trade. Mm -hmm. And 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 then Jesus is dead, and they think, oh, it's all over. The story story ends, but the story didn't end. Mm -hmm. Jesus is gonna show himself powerful, victorious over the grave. Wow. Simon Peter yeah. saith unto them, I go fishing. And they say unto him, we also go with thee. You know what he's doing? He's influencing the other disciples to just basically give up and go back to the world. But I love how the Bible doesn't stop here because Jesus ends up coming up. And then they go fishing and the Bible says in verse 3, they caught nothing. They had toiled all night. They caught nothing. Verse 4, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Yeah. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast a net on the right side of the ship, 
and you shall find it. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Amen. Is, is Jesus God? Amen. I had some Jehovah's Witnesses come and knock on my door and tell me how Jesus was not God. And uh, listen, this is just one part, but if Jesus can control the fish in the sea, remember Jesus... Jesus didn't allow his disciples to catch any fish that night. Why? Because they went back to doing something they weren't supposed to. Okay. He wanted them to go out and preach the gospel. Yes, sir. But what did they do? They went back to the world. Okay. Right? Yes, so Jesus made all those fish leave that boat. But when Jesus says, cast your net on the right side, Jesus commanded all the fish to go towards that boat. And the Bible says they couldn't their, their nets were breaking because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat onto him, for he was naked. Now that's a whole different story for a whole different day. I don't believe he was fully naked, just his outer garments. And then cast himself into the sea. What was he doing? He threw himself into the sea and he was he was he was swimming so fast just to try to get to Jesus and embrace him. Oh my goodness. And then and then Jesus has a conversation with Simon Peter. And he tells him, just like how he denied Christ thrice, he told him three times, Simon Peter, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. Simon Peter, lovest thou me? Feed my lambs, my little ones. That's us. What is he telling him? He's telling them to go out and to preach the gospel, feed them spiritually speaking. And then Jesus pointed at the fish and he said, Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than these? You love me more than the things of the world? For us believers, do you love the things of the world, the temporal, your stuff, your materialistic things, your house, your business, your car, whatever you have, you love it more than the Lord Jesus Christ? The answer should be absolutely no. No, 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 no. Not even the old it's guy because of the little faith that people have. Because you think if you have a little extra money, things are going to be better with you. But if you really try Jesus and see what happens, if you just get what you were given and see what happens, you'll find out. If he supplies for the birds, he will take care of you. Amen. All your need, you may not have the extra you want, Amen. but your needs will be met. It's Amen. the little faith. Amen. Thank you. Speaking about second chances, yes. the Lord Jesus Christ gave Peter a second chance. Yes. How about uh, Saul? Saul of Tarsus. How we would go out there and drag Christians, drag believers from those churches, from the houses, and persecute them. God gave him a second chance. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, Wherefore, Paul speaking, I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given unto me, by the effectual working of his power unto me, who am less than all the least of the saints. You notice his humility is this grace given. God, God had grace and mercy towards me. God should have killed me for all my sin. But he had mercy towards me that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You think about that. You know what Paul's saying? Paul's saying, I just wanted just, just a little, little spot in heaven. I don't deserve all of this glory and all of this grace that God has given me because I used to persecute and murder and, and cause a havoc to the church. Remember when Jesus spoke to, to Saul, who later became Paul, he told him, Paul, why persecutest thou me? What is he saying? We are the body of Christ. When someone hurts the church, the body of Christ, in all reality, we're hurting him. That's why Jesus says, why persecutest thou me? Number one, God sent a storm in Jonah's life to get a hold of him. Number two, God heard Jonah's prayer. When God sent a storm, Jonah prayed. God heard his prayer. Praise God for answered prayer, for God hearing our prayers. God could very easily, you didn't want to listen to me, I'm not going to listen to you. But God is not like man. God is merciful. Number three, God gave Jonah a second chance. Praise God for that second and third and fourth and fifth chance. And number four, God reframed Jonah's perspective. Reframed Jonah's perspective. 
What did he do? He changed his mindset. Right? We often treat the book of Jonah as if it ends in chapter 3. God calls Jonah and, and he disobeys in chapter 1. Uh, chapter 2, Jonah cries out to God and repents from the whale's belly. Number uh, Chapter 3, Jonah preaches in Nineveh and God brings the greatest revival recorded in history. <clears throat> this story would be a lot more idealistic if it ended there, but it doesn't. Jonah, one who had, who had just had received the greatest mercy of God was angry at God for showing mercy towards the people of Nineveh. Remember, that's the reason why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Again, we, we mentioned that he was prejudiced. He didn't like them, right? He had rather basically die than to go back and to preach to, to the people of Nineveh. Let me give you A, under God reframing Jonah's perspective, it's impossible to comply Without transformation. Speaking about that transformation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he be a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, back in the days, I'd go and drink it up with my friends or smoke or party. And, and uh, we'd all get along. But as soon as I gave myself to the Lord Jesus Christ and I became born again, God changed my perspective. God changed uh, everything, all of my desires, God had changed my mind and my heart yes, yeah. and given me a new heart and a new mind. Yes, and all of a sudden they think I'm weird. They think it's strange. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I, I don't want to do any of those things anymore. That becomes old. Becomes old. Absolutely. But we must comply. Comply to what? We must comply to the Lord. When God speaks, yes, sir. Yes, Lord. You know, it's very easily, we, we use this word very loosely, Lord. You know what Lord means? It means master of our yes. lives. Uh -huh. Is he the Lord of your life? Yes. yes. Definitely. That's a big statement, right? Mm -hmm. To make him Lord over your life means that you're giving him every fiber of your being for him to control your vessel. Mm -hmm. is, he, is he Lord of, over your life? And that's what he desires. And he's worthy of that. Amen? He is worthy of that. Amen. God desires to change our hearts. He wants to conform us into the image of his dear son. Mm -hmm. That's what he wants to do, right? He's the potter and we're the clay. Are you going to allow him to uh, mold you and shape you and conform you into the image of his son? Or are we going to be like John 8, how Jesus had the interaction with the Pharisees, and he said, you are like your father, the devil. Oh and the deeds of your father do you do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. He's a liar and the father of it. You see, God's main purpose of putting us here on this earth is, number one, for us to have a relationship with him. And number two, for us to spread the gospel uh, to the ends of the earth. We're on a mission. Right? We're on a mission. And when Peter said, behold, I go fishing, and the disciples said, we go with thee, mm. he was going back to the things of the world. Oh. Mm. Jesus had to show himself victorious over the grave. And then that sparked, that sparked something in Peter's heart, and he said, oh, I'm going to go preach one of the one of the greatest revivals in history on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter number 2. One of them being, of course, in Jonah with Nineveh. But you notice how when Peter has stood up towards the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, that, that 50th day, when Peter has stood up and he had preached the gospel there unto those people, the Bible says thousands were given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was amazing. He had boldness, right? A, it's impossible to comply without transformation. And B, God's plan is always bigger than us. <clears throat> Listen, Jonah, Jonah was concerned more about himself than he was with the, with the others, with those thousands and thousands of people. But God's plan is always bigger than us. When God had told Jonah to go to that great city to preach unto them, for them to repent, God had loved. And he had a desire for those people to get saved. Jonah chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Then said the Lord, 
hast thou had pity over the gourd? Remember how Jonah basically went and, and he laid down underneath what's called a gourd, like a, a, a tree, if you will, to gather some shade over him because it was a hot day. The Bible says in Jonah 4, 6, and 7, And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to cover over Jonah, and that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. <laughs> this guy's in grief. Why? Because he knew that the people were going to repent. He didn't want them to repent. He wanted God to destroy them. Amen. Prejudice, right? Amen. Amen. So Jonah was exceedingly glad for the gourd, <clears throat> but God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd and it withered. You notice the, you notice God's going to give an illustration here, a real life event towards Jonah. Jonah's upset now. He ain't got that, that tree covering him from, from the sun anymore. And now he's upset about that, that tree. And he says this, then said the Lord, you've had pity over the gourd. For which thou hast not labored. You haven't labored. You haven't even created this tree. Right? Neither made us it grow when it came up in the night and perish in the, uh, when it came up in the day and perish in the night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle? And in fact, God said, Jonah, it's not about you. It's not about how you feel. It's about my mercy and my grace. And it's about all the rest of these people. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11 says this. Now, no chastising for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the more peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You see, when God brings a storm your way, or when God brings a trial your way, or when God chastens you because of your disobedience, it's for your own good. We spoke about that last week, about my son and my daughter. When they do something wrong and I chastise them, then I'm doing it out of love for their own good. God shakes the ground from underneath us to get a hold of us, to change our perspective, for us to be able to shift our focus from the things of the world, the temporal, unto the things which are eternal, the things that, that matter and will last for eternity. Amen. You see, all the things of the world are going to perish one day. But only the things that are done for Christ are going to last. Mm. Where's, where's our perspective this good morning? Good point, good point. Let's focus on how many times God has given us chance over chance over chance over Amen. chance. Oh, wow. Patience and grace and long suffering. You know, the Bible says that God is long suffering to us. Well. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. Right? Now, now we can repent verbally. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. And the next day, I'm doing it again. Oh, wow. Oh, no. But listen, empty words and empty hearts don't mean a thing to the Lord. Yeah. God looks at the heart. And God knows a true, genuine, repentant heart. Yes. And God wants to put his power and his spirit and his mercy on that soul. Amen. God wants to use us. And he puts you where he needs you. Right. For his glory. For his glory. Right. <laughs> Jonah. It's not about you. Class, it's not about us. There are millions and billions of souls out there who are dying without knowing the gospel. Amen. And what are we doing about it? Are we prejudiced towards people? Are we going to be quiet and not, not speak up and not share the light with the, about the Lord Jesus Christ to the world? Are we going to go out and blow the trumpet? But we need to live it. Right? We need to live it. Amen. I see that track in your purse, sister. Amen. 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 But listen, we need to live it. We can't go preaching when we're the ones living like the heathen. Right? If, if we're going to spread the light, we need to be the light. We need to live the light. Amen. I hope this was a good study. Praise the Lord for Jonah. Amen. Let's, let's not get eaten up uh, 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 by a by a whale, uh, amen. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> amen. Any questions? No. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth chances, Lord. Oh, Lord, 
you are you are such long suffering. You, your grace and your mercy exceed the heaven of heavens. Yes. Father, thank you for your love towards us. Lord, I pray you change our perspective this morning. Help us to uh, shift our focus from the temporal, the things of the world, unto the eternal. Yes, Father, unto the things that line up with your will. Just like Jesus, when he taught us to pray, you said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, Father, Father, I pray that we don't go back to the things of the world. Lord, that the world is empty and the things out there are empty and, and they got nothing for us, Lord. I pray that you'll keep us on the straight and narrow. I pray that you help us to be able to live our lives fully and well-pleasing for you, Father, please. Thank you for the study. Thank you so much for the word of God. It gives us hope. Lord, it's, it's our anchor to our soul. We love you so much. Please go before us as we go uh, to church. Please be with our pastor. Use him in a mighty way. And uh, we sure do love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. I believe we still have some coffee back there. With that, uh, with that hour going back, I tell you.